let's talk about what is statistical significance. Statistical significance allows us to answer the question of how can we be sure that the test results will repeat. We define the level of statistical significance as 1 minus alpha to set an acceptable level of mistakenly rejecting the null hypothesis. So thinking that we see an impact, we expect it when there is no impact. It is so-called false positive. Usually, alpha is somewhere between 1 and 10%, with most common for digital experiments having alpha of 5%. This means that if we run the test 100 times, in 5 times out of the 100, we will have a false positive result. When alpha equals to 5%, we have a statistical significance of 95%. Alpha is something that we compare the p-value of the test to, but we will discuss that a little bit later in the part where we will do the A-B test analysis. Different types of tests require different levels of significance, and it's very likely that you will be asked a question during your interview of why we chose the statistical significance of 95%. And when testing, for example, a different website layout or a new feature, we may be okay with 5% of false positives. It may not be such a drastic business impact and it will be all right for us because the trade-off is between how long we have to run the test and how many users we have to expose to and how high we can have the level of statistical significance. When testing a new type of medicine, however, we might want to have the highest possible level of significance for example, of 1% or even 0.1%. It is very important to have in those cases the lowest possible amount of false positives because someone's life depends on that. Our ability to reach the level of statistical significance depends on the metrics we target, the length of the experiment, and the number of exposed users. Forward in the course, we will discuss on how to calculate the duration of the test and the number of exposed users to be able to always reach the statistical significance depending on our minimum detectable effect. Now, to make sure that we are not rejecting a successful test, we need to introduce the power of the test. We define the test power as 1 minus beta to set a level of mistakenly accepting the null hypothesis, so thinking that we don't have an impact when we expected that there will be impact. It is so-called false negative. Usually, beta is somewhere between 10 and 20%, with most commonly for digital experiments having beta equals up to 20%. This means that if we run the test 100 times, in 20 times out of 100, we will have a false negative result. So when beta equals to 20, we have the test power of 80%. Similarly to choosing alpha or statistical significance level, when we decide on test power, we need to take into account how critical would it be to mistakenly accept the null hypothesis. So thinking that there is no impact when there is actually test impact. It is more common to allow that to accept the mistakenly accept the null hypothesis because the decision would be to not roll out the successful A-B test. And though that's a missed opportunity, of course, and wasted resources of implementing the test and running it, it is less critical than rolling out an unsuccessful A-B test. It's also very common that during interviews about A-B testing, you will be asked about type 1 and type 2 errors, and it is related to the topic that we're discussing right now. So let's talk about the click-through rate and our minimal detectable effect of 5.5% change. This table shows us when we have a true negative, true positive, false negative and false positive, or type 2 error and type 1 error. So when we have a click-through rate difference less than 5.5%, so there is no change according to our definition, there is no positive impact from the test, and we decide that test is not successful, that is a correct decision, and it's called a true negative, and the probability of that decision is 1 minus alpha, so 95% in our case if we chose the alpha of 5%. In the same situation, if we do decide that test is successful, that is called type 1 error and it is a false positive. The probability to have a false positive here equals alpha, so it's 5%. In the case when we have a click-through rate difference in test group compared to the control group over 5.5%, we see a positive change. So if in that case we decide that test is not successful, this is a type 2 error, so false negative and the probability of type 2 error is equal to beta, so the 20% or 10% depending on the decision that we made. 
If we do decide that test is successful, it is a correct decision and it's called true positive and the probability of that would be 1 minus beta or 80% if we define beta as 20%. It is also a good idea to think about the type 2 and type 1 error in terms of rejecting or accepting the null hypothesis. Nailing down this part and being able to talk about type 1 and type 2 errors and rejecting and accepting null hypothesis during your interview process is very crucial to make sure that the others who interview you see you as a person who knows what they're talking about. Because believe it or not, it's very common to you know, mess it up a little bit and forget which one is type 1 error, which one is type 2 error, and of course that's not a great impression to have during an interview process. So how does test power and significance relate to type 2 and type 1 errors? In the case when null hypothesis is true, where we do not see any difference and we don't reject the null hypothesis, it is a true negative. In the case where null hypothesis is false and we reject the null hypothesis, it is a true positive. And in the cases where null hypothesis is true, but we do reject the null hypothesis, it's type 1 error or false positive. In the case where null hypothesis is false, but we do not reject the null hypothesis, it is type 2 error or false negative. Now, how does all of this apply to the practical perspective of setting up an A-B test? Knowing our minimum detectable effect, the desired statistical significance level and the desired power of the test, we will be able to calculate the sample size of the test. So how many users should be exposed to control group and to test group to be able to reach our significance levels. It is important to know the underlying distribution of the metrics we are using and in the next part I will explain why and how does that affect the calculation of the sample size. It will also be very important to know whether we wanted to use two-tail test or one-tail test. We either want to know that the click-through rate in the test group is bigger than the click-through rate in the control group, or we want to know that the click-through rate in test group is different than in control group. And those are two different calculations of the sample size. The second option requires two-tail test that increases the sample size, but often is a much more practical option to go with. If the test turns out to be negative for your success metric, you will at least want to know that with certainty.